Hi, this is Tom McCullough, and I'd like to welcome you to the Wealth of Wisdom podcast. Episodes of this podcast are an audio companion to the book, Wealth of Wisdom, Top Practices for Wealthy Families and Their Advisors, by, written by myself, Tom McCullough, and Keith Whitaker. It's really an opportunity for our contributing authors in the book to talk a bit about themselves, their work, and their specific ideas in the chapter that they wrote in the book. In this episode today, my, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mimi Ramsey and Stephanie Hardwick, uh, and they wrote a chapter called Expectations Versus Agreements, and if you haven't read it, it's definitely worth it. So uh, looking forward to talking about it, and welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Honored to be here and be featured in the book. Super, thanks. So maybe we'll jump right in um, and maybe start by telling us a little bit about what you do and kind of how you found your way into this kind of work. Sure, I'll go first. This is um, Stephanie Hardwick. And, you know, I came into this work. I was doing a therapy and coaching combination in uh, Bellevue, Washington, which is the east side of Seattle. And most of my work was focused on um, both therapy and leadership and organizational development. But I started having these clients come in that were um, either having um, sudden wealth or struggling with wealth transition. And so because of where I live, the demographic, I started recognizing that the traditional training that I had wasn't fitting the typical struggles of these clients. And I really saw quickly that they needed somebody supporting them that understood this particular cultures and these unique challenges that they experienced. So I started reaching out and this is how I found Mimi as someone who was in the industry that could kind of bridge that gap in my knowledge. And this was, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago now. And, um, so grateful that I did that. So um, since then, it's become a passion of mine, because I know this sounds kind of funny when you talk about families of abundance, they're underserved. And I think they're underserved because there aren't that many people that understand the unique challenges that these folks face. Cool. Yeah, Tom, I came from the other end of the spectrum. I worked in wealth management for over 20 years and certainly guided a lot of wealth creators and wealth inheritors and in how to adapt to the wealth that they were now navigating and had to handle. And I found myself unable to handle, again, the, the separate issues that weren't related to managing the money. It had much more to do with the qualitative aspects of how do we transition this well and how do we help our family thrive over the long term. And so I switched towards the coaching realm to help me develop my own individual skills and then chose it full time because I could see the impact it was having for my clients. Amazing. And speaking of your clients, who are your clients? Like what kinds of people and, and uh, what, what types of people, how do they find you? How does it, you know, how does, how does it work? We usually um, get clients that are experiencing a pain point and it's typically relational within their family. It's either relational or it's an imagined future that is scaring them. And it's usually around wealth transition, right? Looking at, am I prepared? My parents aren't speaking with me uh, or there's not enough transparency or things aren't going well or the other way generationally. You've got um, the creator generation looking down and the path and they're concerned about the future, thinking that maybe I haven't done something right or things aren't going well. So there's typically some friction in the family and somebody within a family office, a wealth advisor, they are finding that their work is getting stuck or truncated because these relational, like people call them soft skills, but I think they're the, probably the most critical skills, but they're not being handled well. And so they can bring in someone like us to help kind of smooth that out and get everybody functioning as a team so that then other people can come in and do the work that they do so well easier. And is the common element, um, these are families of wealth, or do you uh, focus on families with operating businesses, or does it matter to you either way? It, it doesn't matter either way. We are not family business consultants, but mostly it is, it is families, right? It's the dynamics of the family that is going on um, relationally that's getting challenged, and that's where we, we thrive. They have been in business together right now. I currently have a family that's in 
business together and it definitely comes up and they also have a family business coach because that is not the hat we wear. <laughs> so I get them prepped to do that work well. Cool. Um, what, what would you say are some of the myths in this, in your field? Um, you know, you th like, there's a lot of people who look at your field and, and are happy enough not to be involved in it because it's complicated and, but, and sometimes it seems, seems impossible when you, when you look at a conflict and you think, wow, how would we ever cut that Gordian knot? So, um, what, what, what are some of the myths that you've found in your practices? I would say one of the number one myths that we have is that more money will solve problems, right? Having enough will make everything okay. So that, that wanting to have security, wanting to have the future locked in and just making sure that the math works, um, focusing on the quantitative is going to make everything okay. Whereas our work focuses on moving from that natural compulsion to only focus on the quantity and the structures of the finances and start honoring more the quality. It's like how we live with that quantity that makes all of the difference. So I think the myth of where the focus should be, and we think it should be more on the quality of life the conversations that you're having, the quality of those relationships, and then allowing the money to support that quality. We are a uh, multifamily office. And in our, one of the questions we ask in our discovery process is uh, what are the best three things you've done for yourself and your family in the last 12 months? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's a fascinating conversation. We, we always say we wait an uncomfortably long period of time until both of the couple, it's often a couple, uh, answer the question. And, uh, but the most interesting thing is that it's never about money. Hmm. You know, it's, it's never, you know, I earned X percent rate of return or I saved this much tax. It's, you know, I lost 35 pounds or we, we have not been together as a family since the, since COVID and we finally got together or I haven't spoken to my sister for three years and we finally talked last week. And, you know, yeah. and then we say, how do you want to answer that question a year from now? And so it begins, instead of saying, what are your goals? It's, it's helping people think about, you know, what is important to me and, and, and but what they're self-describing is that it's usually not about the money, the money we're teaching them that money is a tool right. to help them do some of the things they want to do. So yeah. it's, uh, it sounds like we're aligned in that point of view. Yeah, I love that. And looking at the neutrality of money, because it really is neutral. Our society and our conditioning doesn't make it feel neutral. But if it falls into that neutral category, then you can decide to kind of use money as medicine or to use money as a support for these other things that are beautiful and in place, right? And support mm -hmm. your values versus it being the value. And then the family is to con conform to that, you know, structure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so here's one for you. What, what's uh, what's the most common question people ask you? Say they maybe, I don't know, if you're on a plane or something and people say, what do you do? And, you know, what, what's the question people ask? Tom, I'm going to jump in and answer one question. I've got a terrible throat, so you're going to find Stephanie's answering nearly all the questions. But here's one I'm going to jump in and answer. Thanks, Mimi. Um, what I hear most often is how do other families get this right? The families that do wealth transfer well, how do they do it as if there's some magic formula? And there isn't. It's what we have found in our work, and I think most advisors realize is you have to find what's right for that family. And mm -hmm. each, each family is going to have their own unique path to getting it right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. I love too um, what you said about um, being on a plane when people find out what I do. And I do find that when I'm on a plane, people get very interested in what I do. When I say I work with high net worth families around challenges of wealth transition, they, the first thing they say is, why aren't they happy? Uh. I find so it's different than what like the, my clients would ask me, but that's what from the outside in. And it's that myth again, they'll say, well, what, what do they have to be unhappy about or, or as if they don't have any challenges. And again, it's the cultural myth that more equals better. And I have such an honor to be able to sit there in that aisle and say it's neutral, right? So whatever problems exist, money is just like a, an, an accelerant. So it just makes things, you know, more difficult. And 
if there's not those healthy relations in place. And so I love busting that myth. I find sometimes people ask if everybody is like the people on succession. Oh, <laughs> and right. I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to say, nope, there are a lot of them are like nice, normal people. <laughs> right. You wouldn't even know, right? You don't even know some even of know. them. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I'm going to turn the question around. What's the most common question that you ask others? Well, Other I'm going to. Clients or, or a prospective client or whatever. Yeah. Well, I'm going to use it in regards to the tool in the chapter, right? So if we're in this tool now, looking at the difference of expectations versus agreements, right? So we're, let's say we've been hired in a family and um, they're struggling. I will ask them kind of, it's a nasty list, but like, where do they have resentments or frustrations? And we have them make a list because I want to hear that because mm -hmm. that is access to everything. Because if something's not going well, um, I want to hear where are these friction points, right? What would you like to be different? Mm, I like that. Gets it on the table. Right. But one, of, one of my favorite questions is, um, can't usually start with this, but is, uh, hmm. <laughs> yes. Or if I'm going to go really crazy, tell me more. Right. Say more. It's, <laughs> it's just all we always get the gems after that, you know, and for a person like me who likes to make people feel comfortable, often part of that is often filling silence and you have to learn yeah. not to do that and allow the silence to be there because people are thinking and mm -hmm. or they're getting up courage to uh, think of that list you're talking about and the things that they're upset yeah. about. Maybe they've maybe they've squashed those down for a long time and haven't had a any, you know, um, permission to, to raise them. And now you're asking them to actually say it out loud and very interesting. And then also asking them, how do they make sense of it? Right. That way you get a really good view of the reality that they've painted around a particular difficulty and having them assess, you know, where are these difficulties come from? What is the root cause? What is perpetuating it before? And that, this was probably something I've learned over time, you know, before I insert my viewpoint, right? I think is, yeah. as, you know, coaching is so good at that, right? That it tells you to just more silence, more inquiry and being quiet as you get the reality of that the clients are living in. Yeah. So we all want to be so helpful. So very often we find advisors who want to be helpful or family office uh, or uh, family leaders who want to be helpful have a solution in their mind. And they want to guide the family towards that solution. And so, Tom, I love your questions are so open-ended and so generous with space to let the family tell you where they need to go. Mm -hmm. It does take maturity and courage because it, it because the open space uh, and questions can make it look like you don't know what you're doing. And the point really is you don't actually know what you're doing. <laughs> the, you know how to help people, but you don't know their answer. So right? it's a, it is a very interesting question. So you it's, sort of, oh, go ahead, Stephanie. No, I was going to say though that, and this might help for anybody who's like shopping can, coaches, a really good coach doesn't know before getting to know you. And I think that that's really critical that they should be asking really get to know you type of questions before they're talking about themselves, right? There is an art in not knowing. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, so we've kind of launched into the chapter. So that's perfect segue. So the chapter was called it is called expectations versus agreements. And I can um I can vouch for uh if people haven't read it yet, they should. It's a great concept. I hadn't heard of it before and I really like it a lot. So maybe you can start by just giving sort of a two or three sentence summary of the chapter, and then we'll delve into the chapter in detail. Yeah, in very short, um, it's the idea that expectations don't work. And as much as possible, and we even do the very rebellious act of saying to 100%, if you can, live a life of nothing but agreements. So have no expectations and live all of life by agreement only. Interesting. So now, my first... Oh, did you I, want to add something? I, yeah, I want to tag yeah. onto that because I know that's going to sound so extreme because we live in a culture that is developed through expectations. We all hold expectations of neighbors, of family, of kids, of parents, of our careers, of ourselves. And uh, so I love that Stephanie started with the real extreme. 
moving from expectation, letting go of holding any expectation and looking for an opportunity to tr to, to transition into co-created agreements is the way to resolve some of all the, the, some of the conflict that we've seen in families that we work with. Yeah, that's great. I'm always interested why, why you think this topic is so important. And of all the, the, uh, the um, tools and practices you could have chosen, because I'm sure you've got many in your toolkit. Why did you choose this one? I think this one emerges because it profoundly shifts how people relate to each other. So expectations, which again, our culture, we are an expectation culture, right? You have performance reviews that say meets expectations. In fact, I just saw a parenting video that I was watching and they said, make sure that you're clear about your expectations. And I'm, you know, going crazy inside of myself because the reality is, is that expectations might produce an outcome, but at what cost? And the cost is disengagement, lack of motivation, resentment, blame, shame. It, it definitely can be effective, but human nature is one that we rebel against expectations and we don't like people to have expectations. So it doesn't work with how humans work. So when I... <clears throat> do this, it's a bit of a shock for everybody. In fact, I get a lot of kind of frustration and anger. Like, what do you mean? I'm not supposed to have expectations. I'm a leader of this family, or I'm a leader in this organization. I should have mm -hmm. expectations. And it's very controversial for me to walk in there and say, well, start there, but please don't create from your expectations. And agreements are co-created where everybody is involved in the outcome. And so everybody's on board and we like keeping our word when we've had part of the creation of, you know, setting goals for the outcomes. Um, you know, it's a big difference when, you know, you're saying, I expect you to be financially independent by 30 when you're 28 and have never worked a job, don't even know what that means maybe two years isn't enough time for you, right? Like it is a entirely different conversation when it's like, let's focus on financial independence and what agreements can we make to get there? You will have parties that are engaged if they're a part of the solution. And Tom, I would just add to that. Money is such a difficult subject for most families to talk about. We know that there's so much that goes unsaid and without clear communication, we all form our own assumptions. We decide what makes sense to us, what we think should happen based on our unique view of the world. And that leads to expectations. And just, from that comes the frustration when they're not met. I was just thinking that you were talking about the, the stuff in your time with the um, family patriarch, you know, who might talk about expectations. I have this expectation of you, but, but Mimi, you're, saying that, you know, a lot of expectations aren't even spoken. So that's a, that's a confusing one too. People who have expectations of you, but don't speak them, at least in the patriarch situation, they may be unrealistic or too forceful, but at least they're out there. But then there's a whole category of expectations that we never say, you know, well, you should know what my expectations are, or, you know, I don't feel like I have the right to say them or whatever. So anyway, we were kind of dancing around, giving people an idea of this. So now let's go for it. Walk us through the actual exercise. What, what, how would a family use this? Yeah. So it's kind of helping people understand what contributes to the resentment, right? So when you start with this list, which is not a very good, high energy, feel good list, but you get it out there beneath every single one of these frustrations, I promise you is an unfulfilled expectation or an undelivered expectation, one that hasn't even been spoken. It's been assumed. So you, you go through this ugly list and then you start identifying what are these expectations that are out there that are not being met. And then you walk them through a process of taking that expectation and turning it into a request. Now requests become very delicate because a lot of times, and certainly if you've got a generational hierarchy, demands are delivered as requests. And so you walk through people through a process about making a really healthy request, which means if you make a request, you're willing for three answers, like very willing, yes, no, or here's how I would change it. 
So a true request is going to be open to those three answers. And so you kind of have a choice, like, can you compromise, right? Arrive at some type of agreement because sometimes expectations can also just be let go of, by the way. And this one also, I get a little bit of pushback. Not every single expectation has to go towards an agreement, right? I had uh, family members that were upset. Something happened in the stock market that um, impacted negatively one member of the family. The other members of the family had no idea they were involved in this scandal, zero. So the expectation was, as you would show up for me and you would be there for me. Well, quite literally, they had no idea that their portfolio included this problem. So the client was like, oh, I will drop the expectation that my family doesn't support me in things that they don't know about. <laughs> right? that, that seems reasonable. <laughs> Correct. And so, you know, it's you can drop expectations, but if you decide it's one that you cannot, you know, let go of, which is natural and healthy, then you move into making requests of each other. And then you literally keep at it until you arrive at a co-created agreement. What can we agree to? Mm hmm. So I wonder if this is a good time to walk us through a couple of examples. You know, I, I think it's hard for people to understand exactly what that might be. I know there's some in the chapter. I don't know, you could use one of those or you could just use, use another example. Take us from, you know, step one, making the list right through to agreements. Yeah, I think that um, probably a very hot topic where expectations one run rampant are in the realm of entitlement. So. Mimi and I, as we've been, you know, using this and thinking about it, we had this, this was years ago, but we had this huge epiphany. Like, I don't like the word entitlement, by the way, I'm only using it. So people understand what I'm talking about. I usually say financially dependent adult or, but in this dynamic, it's just expecting entitlement is nothing but expecting, which I love that because it's like, it simplifies the whole scenario. So I'll just use an it's example. It's less you've... pejorative too. It's yeah. And it's like, oh, well, it's in human nature to be yeah. conditioned. We're conditioned into expecting. So it's almost like, well, of course you do. Of course. It's because we're we... taught that expectations are good. So it's already normalizing. Go ahead, Mimi. Sorry. I was just going to say entitlement at, at its at, basically it's expecting somebody else to fulfill the gap between what I have and what I want. I just expect somebody else to fill that gap. Right. It's not an agreement, all entitlement. There's no agreement happening. So what you can do, if you have a family that's struggling with that dynamic, you can sit everybody down and boy, you want to go through the list of resentments. I mean, certainly the parenting generation is super frustrated. And so is the younger generation, right? Mm -hmm. They don't feel listened to, heard, appreciated, all these things. So you go through and I'll use that example of like financial independence, right? There might be this idea of I paid for your college. I've given you the car. I even got you, a, you know, all the resources that you need. You should be financially independent, but they're not. And you're writing those things down on your own first. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Typical Typically situation? you want people to be able to work in a trusted environment where they're unfiltered. They can just let their resentments fly. And that's not necessarily for the whole group. It can be sometimes, and it would definitely depend on the family and the level of relating. Some families can handle that with courage and be in those conversations of love and truth. And it's why there's a difference between facilitating a family and then working individually with clients, which we do a combination of. Some families can be all together immediately. Other families, you need to do pre-work with the individuals so that when we come together as a group, everybody is in really good form so that more damage doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you get that list and then um, you find out like what types of things are you automatically assuming should happen? because they're not, and this is the source. And so it helps people kind of own their resentment and own their frustration because they might realize, I assumed something here that my parents would buy me that $90,000 car. I just assumed that, but we didn't have an agreement. So that is a really helpful question to ask. And now I'm thinking, this is probably what I should have said when you said, what question do you ask? If people are struggling and they're in their resentment, I'll say, well, what agreements are in place about that? And they'll say, well, what do you mean agreements? I'm like, well, what did they agree to? What did your parents agree to? 
Well, we looked at cars once. (laughs) My friend got one. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yes. God help that everyone has one. Um, Or Instagram. It's I see on Instagram. Um, So that will right there show that they're not right. Functioning in a way that's helping people relate. So you get a list of like, I just assumed that this would happen. Right. I assumed that I would be able to live. We own buildings that I would always have the penthouse apartment in these rental buildings. Like that's just an assumed. Okay. Right. And so then you, what you can do is you get these expectations and then they get to test it out with each other. Is that true for them? Right. So then you would get a person sitting down with their parents saying, these were the assumptions that I was making. And you can see that they're like, well, no, I did not agree to that. That's not how I see things, right? I see you getting your own car. I see you not working in the family business and working outside the family business. So you can see where there's a reality gap. Mm -hmm. And then that's where you start making requests of each other. And then the, so, so um, let, let's say, let's use your example of the child uh, expecting a car, for example, yeah. And the parents said, say, well, no, that wasn't our understanding. So then the request comes and says, well, would could could I have one of those cars? And you right. have to be ready for a yes, a no, or let's, you, you can have a bicycle. Right. So, um, and, and then you go to the agreement stage right. and say, you know, if you do the following things, then maybe it's possible to have a car. Is that, am I getting Correct. that right? So you get to some realities. One. Uh, rising gen needs a car. <laughs> so you, that's a reality, right? So then you start working with what agreements can we make around that? So you end up like in this one situation, the agreement was made when you source your own job and you're in that career for one year, we will buy you the $90,000 car. Right. And the, yep. And that was negotiated by both and they all agreed. And that actually was the case. I am very happy to say. And, you know, there are times too where in this particular situation um, they wanted to short circuit the agreement. So at nine months there was like, Hey, I've done it for nine months. I really like this now. And there was a bit of a ruffle and it was like, no, that wasn't the agreement. So you can always fall back to the agreement. And that is what I love. So in this um, model, when you're moving to agreements, you can always look to them as the source so that, you know, they're, the agreements are neutral, but they're in place and it doesn't make somebody bad or wrong. So when the parents said no to that, they could go back to, well, this is the agreement. It's not us being jerks. We're going to stick to the agreement and we're going to keep our word. And we, you know, we have an agreement that we keep our agreements. And so you can fall back to that agreement and it will hold as opposed to blaming individuals. But it's also the point where other expectations get surfaced yeah but you always gave in early before and so i just assumed you were going to do you typically recommend that people write these agreements down or are they mostly verbal how, how does it typically work yeah we we when we facilitate um you've hired professionals now, right? So we also keep the agreements, but right. All of that will kind of be written down in outcomes about what new, I have, there's always this um, new agreements that we've made when we work with people so that they walk away with a definite hard copy reminder of these are the agreements that we've made together. And, you know, you can do this preventatively as well as you know, when there's a, a problem, as, as you well know, of course, but just in our practice, um, we'll often do what we call a family playbook or a, some people call it a constitution. And what you're writing down is often agreements, you know, um, let's decide together how, you know, parents have money and kids don't often. So, and there's houses and cars that are needed or living accommodation and cars. And so, you know, what if we agreed ahead of time? about how we're going to handle this or, or cohabitation agreements or, you know, prenups or, 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 you know, expectations for education or whatever it is, I sh- expectations, I shouldn't use that word, agreements for education. Yeah, but, nice, but, thank you. But having, <laughs> having some of those conversations ahead of time, mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, uh, when there's a problem, I'm sure is the holy grail of your work. 
our number, I think my favorite agreement of all is how are we going to agree about how we disagree? Right. So having an agreement about disagreement, I think is the biggest preventative agreement out there because what typically can happen is in that disagreement, there is avoidance, there is rage, there is unkindness and disrespect, and that can erode this whole process. So uh, that is a very important agreement to put in place in the very beginning is how are we going to disagree with each other? Because so many families avoid conflict where they disagree they just go silent which is one of the biggest problems in like wealth transition if they think there's something that might be not taken well nobody talks about it and it's a problem so if you can have this agreement about how you're going to disagree which then you know it's a reality there will be disagreements that it feels safer than to to kind of wade into these conversations and Tom, I would just add on to that. Once families go through this process a couple times of transferring a, an expectation into an agreement, it becomes the new pattern for them. Mm -hmm. They almost get excited because now it feels safe to say, well, I'm holding this expectation and I'd like to articulate a request to you. And right, it becomes the new norm for them and it, it helps them address uh, disagreement more readily. Mm -hmm. And negative yeah. emotions like frustration become a, a, a positive indicator, right? So you don't have to be just grinding in the frustration because you'll probably hear one of our voices in the back of your head going, what agreement do you have in place about that? Or, you know, what agreement do you need to put in place to change this? And, and in some ways, this is what's often referred to as governance. It's like, it's, it's how are you going to decide about the things that we, uh, the things in our lives that are in common. You know, if you're doing something on your own and you're, you can just do it yourself. But if, if there's things in common, shared assets or, or right. shared relationship, or whatever you, you, you have, that's what governance essentially is. People are always confused about governance, but to me, it's just, how are you, how are we going to make decisions together? Especially disagreements. Agreements are easy. You know, right. when we agree, that's easy. But if we're, if we're not sure or, or don't agree, it's trickier. Right. Um, one, of, one of my favorite aspects of this is it takes it out of the realm of somebody being right and the other person wrong, or I'm being better and you're worse. And it makes it, it shifts the focus to how is your, how is your expectation or the way you think about this different than mine? And it focuses on just, we have differences in how we see things. It doesn't make me better or right or you wrong. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so people become less, uh, uh, reactive and, and, um, less justified in their anger. They just realize, oh, it's just different. Mm -hmm. So well, how, uh, I, I'm assuming that this doesn't always go perfectly. So when it doesn't, what's gone wrong? Uh, how do you fix it or come back to it? Or sometimes do you say, you know, it's just not going to work because the family's not willing. Well, I love that you just said this word because that's exactly what the biggest rub would be. And I make this distinction between um, wanting versus willing. Mm. So you might have a whole family engaged in this conversation, mm. but in the end, people want, I want this to be better. I want mm. to be able to sit down at Christmas and have everybody get along. Um, but are they willing to do the work, be open, be flexible? So when it's gone badly, they have not been willing, right? They're, they're holding on to a, a justification or a rightness around expectation, right? I get to have this because this is the way it should be, as opposed to, I realize that feels real and true to me, but I'm willing to be open to trying something different. And that willingness, I think, is the probably the biggest Achilles heel that if you don't assess for that up front, and there have been times where, you know, we missed it, where things got really tense because in the family meeting, you know, somebody doubled down and they had, they had the power right in the decision-making capabilities and they doubled down on wanting to be more right than they were having this um, go peaceful. So that I think is you know, helping people understand wanting versus willing and willing is required. Yeah, I really like that. I think that's very, very helpful. And uh, 
I was thinking too, you know, if, if you back to the request of the younger person to the older person, the older person has the power and perhaps the resources. If that older person says no to every request, you know, that, that maybe is a sign that they're not willing to, to move at all. And if you're not, maybe you want harmony, but if you're not willing to give at all on your side, I assume harmony is impossible. Right. Right. And you can help them understand their resistance. But again, if they're not willing to see something different, because really our, um, our greatest probably focus is on well-being of the family, right? It's the, it's the space between everybody. Like I usually add an extra client there, right? Cause there's all the individuals, but my client is the space between everybody. And so when we're sitting down with people, we want them to recognize that that space between everyone is our client and that has preferences and needs and things that keep it healthy. And so if we focus on the well-being of that invisible client, then that's what we support. Then they can kind of handle the pressure of where they're standing in a position of not willing because what does the that invisible client need? And that can come sometimes help people. You know, I think there was a time I think we are facilitating together and Mimi just, it was a velvet slap where she asked a pat patriarch of the family is like, would you rather be right or have your daughter in your life? Cause we were at that space. What did he say? Daughter. He chose the daughter. I don't know that he, he was even willing to do that. That's in that moment, what he wanted. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, it was in a moment where there was so much resistance. There was so much, I am right. I deserve to ask for this. I'm the one who created this. It has to be this way. I don't trust that she's going to do this. And I, that's when I finally had to ask him, I said, would you rather be right? Or would you rather have a relationship with your daughter in the business going forward? The wanting and willing and the velvet slap. Those are the ones that I'm, I'm going to take away if this is great. Um, we like the velvet slap. We both, you can probably tell by our demeanors, we have a gentle fierceness to us because you know, it's so difficult to be in relationship with another person, period, and then money and those complexities. And, you know, then we've got professionals supporting us. Like, it just gets really complex. And we also um, are very fierce about wanting people to discover their well-being and thriving. So <laughs> we kind of yeah. are masters at the velvet slap. It, it's interesting that, uh, so this is um, February 2024. So this past year and even part of this year, we've actually gone in my own family to um, a kind of a different level with our kids who are 31 and 34 in terms of disclosure. And we always say moving from this to this in mm -hmm. some way, we don't know what that means exactly, but we'd like to do that. And, uh, but the interesting thing I was going to observe is that, you know, I do this for families all the time, but it's really hard to cut your own hair. You know, you need somebody else to help, you know, help you be objective and, and take you out of your role, especially if your role is dad, patriarch, um, you know, CEO of the business, generator of the wealth. It's very difficult uh, for, for some people to move out of that role, but also for other people to see you as a different person. And in fact, one of my kids uh, afterwards, the, the facilitator was getting feedback and they said, it's great because dad, we heard dad talk this time and he often doesn't. And which is often true. I'm often encouraging other people to, but I was forced by the facilitator to say my view. Nice. And I don't know if it's, a, I don't know if it's self-protection or whatever. So I can just kind of keep on top of everything, but, but it was, uh, you know, and, and if it was, I, if it was me in charge, um, you know, of my own family's discussion, it, that just would never have happened. So it's just a great reminder that it's, um, you know, even if you think you know something, and even if you do know something about these kinds of conversations, you still can't do it for yourself as easily because you just need the objectivity, I think. I don't know what you think of that, but uh, that's been my experience. I absolutely agree because we can come in, we're neutral. We don't have, you know, we, so much of our emotions, of course, are in our body, right? So when stuff goes difficult, we're going to preserve and, and, and we come in without those strings so we can have uh, just almost like, like a naive question or, or the questions of curiosity without any emotion attached to it, right? Nothing's difficult for us. And so we can come in and it's not hard for those questions to come out of our mouths where if like, let's say you have like, you know, hierarchy and families, you know, you're going to have a younger generation that might be afraid to ask a question. Well, we're not, you know, <laughs> we just want to know. And so 
<laughs> we can get those questions out there without it having to be difficult. And I think a lot of times we get engaged when you have a rising generation wanting more transparency from their parents, but they're terrified because they don't want to seem greedy or disrespectful or God forbid entitled. Like, and so they're just rendered moot because they don't want to be hurtful or, you know, and so we can come in with curiosity about what have you told them about the, the structures of this trust? Like, cause we need the information. We just do it with them present. <laughs> it's, it's, those are families where you have the wanting and you have the willing, but you maybe don't have the capacity or the, the tools right? mm-hmm. to get to agreements without a, a, an independent voice of some facilitator to help draw out everyone's opinion. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's a great tool. This is a tool that I will um, definitely use. Uh, you know, we, we it, it's funny, all the d- different permutations and combinations. We have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of things we put in the category of what we call fact-based decision-making. Mm-hmm. You know, people say, well, I think this, I think that. Well, why don't we just find out what's true? Let's go find out the answer and then we can have that conversation. And in some ways, that's a little bit what this is too. Let's let's make something true. Let's not just say, well, you have this expectation, I have that. Let's actually make an agreement and then that will be our truth. And yeah. then there's some things that have objective outside truth. You can go find the answer as opposed to all sorts of discussion happens about, I think this, I think that. Well, sometimes we actually can, can know. So yeah. let's do that. I like that. I'm, I'm interested in um, just thinking back over your careers. Uh, you know, what what's what are the most important what's the most important thing you've learned in your career that you you know bring to the party today and for people? I think um, you know, and I don't know Mimi, we've talked about this a lot. You know, when we first got together and started collaborating in this way, we would start with the symptoms, right? So we would start with the friction points in families and we would gather around and we work that through. And, and, um, that had a particular, it was, you know, usually very successful, sometimes rough. And then we recognize that, you know, we need to turn this around and we need to start setting a foundation of well-being with people. So we actually, learned that it is better upfront when we work with an individual or a whole family that we do this work where we establish them in their well-being free of circumstances. And we also have a bit of a curriculum where we help them understand how their mind works, how their reality gets to be with them and help them understand the mechanics of that so that when we all get together, everybody is fully owning their own experience and not in a place of like thinking that other people are creating my experience. And I think that that has been the biggest unlock in outcomes for us. Like we just saw clients thriving differently. We saw clients relating differently because there was this foundation and shared understanding about how everybody works so that they are, have more curiosity. They were understanding separate realities, like what, what's going on within you, what's your world and not, um, not in that confusion about other people being responsible for how they feel. So um, I hope that kind of made sense. It's kind of a big conversation, but I think that's one of the biggest things that we've learned is do that first. And then we add in a really good tool like expectation versus agreement. Yeah. Once people have this shared understanding of how their mind works and where their well being comes from. Tom, I would only add to that. It, to us, it became a way of going upstream going upstream to the problem, instead of coming in where the stick is stuck in the river, going upstream, why is it falling in? Kind of like, how do we get them upstream to understand where did they, where do we form these expectations? It's just thinking. Mm-hmm. And if they can, if they can understand that, then very often those expectations would fall away before we'd have to come in and do a facilitation. Have you read that uh, Chip Heath book or Dan Heath book about called Upstream? Yes, I have it. So I'm reading it by osmosis. It's blue. It's over there. It's blue. Yeah. And they, they basically say, you know, the, the two guys are camping and they see a kid floating down the river drowning. So they run in to try and save him. They drag him to shore. And then there's another kid floating down the river. It looks like he's going to drown. And so after the, like the third one, one of the guys is running away from the river. The other guy says, "What's where are you going? He says, I'm going upstream to find out why all these kids are falling in the river. 
you know, and it's it's great. It's yes. to get to the the cause of this as opposed to just sim- dealing with symptoms. That's great. Right. Um, so so picture people listening to this podcast. They're family members or um, advisors to families who are wrestling with these issues. Maybe it's painful for them. Maybe as an advisor, they're really feeling a family is stuck. What's a concluding message or piece of advice that you would give to people who are listening to this that they can take away? I would say, because it's very quickly and easy to do, like let yourself scan your current present reality. Where do you have resentment? And go, okay, what is the expectation that's not being fulfilled there? And what agreements do I need to put in place to change it? It's that simple. And that can be is everything from, you know, resentful that the dishes aren't getting done all the way up into how we are talking about, you know, the future of real estate being inherited, right? You can just know that your negative reactions, frustrations, resentments are a really good, aha, there's something you can do here. You don't have to just stop there and sit in it and stew, It's a really good indicator to do that equation of going from resentment to expectation to finding new agreements. Anything to add, Mimi? It's, uh, or are you still choking? (laughs) I'm trying not to cough on you. So (laughs) I I wouldn't add anything to that. I think that was just a beautiful way of capturing an easy tool that somebody can use anywhere and anytime. Great. Well, thank you so much. What a great conversation. What a great chapter. Uh, I, you know, um, there's, there's lots of chapters I, uh, in the book I look at and go, wow, that's fantastic. But there's certainly ones that I look at and say, that's not just fantastic, but I'm going to use it. And this is definitely one of them. So thank you very much for, um, you know, capturing the idea in a chapter. Thank you for sharing it so freely. I I've been very impressed with the, the, the willingness of all of these amazing contributing authors to share. I, I think about this book as like a potluck dinner. And if mm-hmm. if every family brings the dish that their family loves, something that you have used that's worked for you, and what if we all brought it? I mean, what an amazing dinner. And that's what the, this, the, the, it's, it's sort of a, this book is a bit of a labor of love for us to pull together and gift to, to families and the community that serves them. To help them, um, you know, be better, and uh, using the, the the wealth of wisdom in in our community. So, thank you very much for participating in that and uh, and for talking to me today. It's oh, been, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's been an honor to be included in this group, and thank you so much for pulling it all together. My pleasure. This was fun. Thanks yeah, so bringing much. our expectation versus agreement side salad was an absolute honor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye.